one topic that polarizes the beekeeping community between pro-treatment beekeepers and treatment-free beekeepers is the contention that treatment-free beekeepers produce what is colloquially known as mite bombs. And we'll get to that right after this. Hi, I'm Scott McPherson, and this is Beekeeping From Scratch, where it's about the bees. Hey beekeepers, welcome to Beekeeping From Scratch, where we are rebuilding our operation from scratch back up to profitability and doing it together with you. Now, before we get started, if we haven't met yet, my name is Scott McPherson, and this is the third installment of my show, Nothing But Bees, a show where we discuss theoretical beekeeping topics such as history, facts, myths, and issues facing our bees. Now, if you have watched two, three, or more beekeeping from scratch videos, please let me take a moment to ask you to subscribe and to be notified of all updates. This way, you'll be notified the minute we upload a new video. Your subscribership and watching these videos will help put these videos in front of more beekeepers and bee-minded people who might benefit from the material. All right, thanks for doing that. I really appreciate it. Now, Back to mite bombs. What are they? A mite bomb is what the beekeeping world believes is a colony that has collapsed or is in the process of collapsing, and the bees are either drifting off to other colonies or the colony is being robbed by other colonies of bees. And by doing so, the hypothesis is that the mites in the collapsing hive are being transmitted to and exploding the numbers in neighboring beehives. Treatment-free beekeepers are most often blamed for producing the aforementioned mite bombs. However, how true is that? First, let's discuss the seasons. When do colonies tend to collapse? In most cases, colonies collapse between late fall and early spring. That's the four months between November and March. For most of this time, the bees aren't brooding much except for maybe a small maintenance patch of brood. They aren't flying and when the bees and colony dies, the mites die with them. Now that takes care of the largest majority of hives that we could call mite bombs. Now, while I won't argue that mites do drift from colony to colony, they most certainly do. I think a little third grade math is necessary to really understand we probably shouldn't be assigning blame to one beekeeper or another. Using numbers from the Bee Inform Project, which has been tracking colony losses since the year 2010, during that time, the average loss of colonies that were treated with chemicals is 24.9%. I'm going to go ahead and round that up to 25%. While those colonies that were not treated were reported at a loss of 32.9%. Now I'll go ahead and round that up to 33% as well. Now I would argue that those numbers are skewed because they do include beekeepers who are just starting out treatment free and therefore suffered the high losses that are expected when bees that have been treated for generations suddenly stop getting treated. Once a treatment-free beekeeper has worked through their losses and starts to regrow their operation from their survivors, these losses decrease dramatically. However, for this discussion, let's be conservative and use the published numbers. After all, those are the numbers that are published, and that's what we have to work with. So between treated and untreated colonies, there is only an 8% difference in survival rate. As I said, let's go ahead and round those off to 25 and 33% respectively. That way, we could say that beekeepers who treat their hives lose, on average, one out of four hives. Or as beekeepers who do not treat their hives lose one out of three hives. That means if we had one of each beekeeper and they had 12 beehives, one beekeeper would have nine survival hives while the other one would have eight. That's not a really big difference, is it? It really makes you ask whether the financial burden of making your bees suffer repeated use of chemicals and acids is really worth the gain of an additional one in 12 beehives, doesn't it? Anyway, back to my bumps. There is something like a ratio of one to seven treatment-free versus treatment beekeepers. I don't think there's a real source for that number, but one to seven does seem to be, you know, the accepted figure. So if we take a representative value of 100 beehives using round numbers, that would mean that 88 of those beehives belonged to beekeepers who treated, and 12 of those colonies 
belong to beekeepers who did not treat the beehives. If the treated bees suffer a loss of one in four, that would mean that 22 of the treated hives died. And if one in three of the untreated hives died, that would mean that four of the untreated colonies died. In that sample of 100 beehives, that would give us 22 potential mite bombs coming from treated hives versus four potential mite bombs from untreated colonies. Aren't there probably more mites in 22 colonies than there are in four? Okay, now let's go ahead and talk one for one here. One hive to one hive. When colonies die and the bees drift with their mites, or bees come to rob out collapsing colonies, which of those drifted mites do you think does the most harm to pro-treatment beekeepers? I would like to ask you the question. Assuming that you treat your bees for mites, if you had to choose which mites you get, would you rather get the mites that have survived years and years and generations of treatments? Or would you rather choose the mites that had no selective pressure for the chemicals that you put in your hives? Which of those mites would be easier for you, for you to handle? What's worse, a bomb of survivor mites or just regular untreated mites? Remember, it only takes one mite with inheritable advantages to make an extended family of them. Tom Seeley recently wrote a port about mite bombs and whether the bees mostly drifted to new colonies or whether other colonies picked up the mites due to robbing out the collapsing colonies. The first paragraph introducing the paper reveals something that all beekeepers really need to come to understand. The parasitic mite Varroa destructor is a recently speciated parasite of the western honeybee Apis mellifera. The parasite feeds upon both juvenile and adult honeybees and is known to transmit harmful viruses between bees. Varroa mites are wingless, eyeless, and unable to crawl between widely spaced honeybee nests. Despite these limitations, honeybee colonies are almost universally infested with these mites, including managed colonies that have recently been purged of mites by the use of chemical treatments and wild colonies spaced widely in forests. What this is really saying is that we as beekeepers need to come to grips with the fact that Varroa really is part of our environment. It's not a pest that is simply being transmitted from an infected hive to an uninfected hive. The mites are everywhere, and the reality is, is that the mites that you have in your colonies are coming from every other neighboring colony in the area through social contact. They are an ubiquitous and omnipresent part of every colony. And we need to stop accusing each other for giving us their mites. It's just plain stupid. It's just as stupid as blaming another beekeeper because their bees came and stole the honey out of your beehives. You don't do that, do you?